Good morning and welcome uh, to our worship this morning and know that no matter who you are or where you are on your journey of life and of faith, you are welcome here. We're hoping the rain stays away and we're hoping the sun stays away so it doesn't get too hot and too wet. Um, but it's wonderful to see you here today. My friends, in the midst of the world's chaos, come to this place and find peace. When your mind is overwhelmed with what you see, come to this place and find hope. If your heart is heavy with fear, with worry, with sorrow, come to this place and find strength. As you long for community in a world that is torn apart, come to this place and find love. Come, people of God, and in this place, in this moment, find peace, hope, strength, and love as we worship and pray together. Let's sing our opening hymn, Draw the Circle Wide. Stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. Draw the still point of the circle, round whom all creation turns. Nothing lost but held forever in God's gracious heart. Draw the circle wide. Draw it wider still. Let this be our song. No one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. I'll touch far horizons, so encompass great and small. Let our love be known, no borders, faithful to God's call. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. The dreams we dream be larger than we've ever dreamed before. Let the dream of Christ be in us, open every door. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. And please join me in the unison opening prayer. God of love and justice, we gather together to worship you, to offer our thanks and praise, and to proclaim your goodness and mercy. Meet us here, breathe your word into our souls, engrave your covenant of love upon our hearts, teach us faithfulness and compassion, so that our lives may reflect your love and justice to the world. Amen. Our reading is from the Gospel according to Luke. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. 
And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side, but a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put his, him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Hear what the Spirit is saying, thanks be to God. Thank you, Amy. So during the summer, I'm preaching on some of Jesus' parables. And so the first time we were together, I preached on the uh, parable of the prodigal son. Um, last week, we heard about the parable of the sower and the seed. Today, I am preaching on probably one of the best known parables of all. The parable of the Good Samaritan. So there's this neuroscientist, um, his name is Dr. Antonio Damasio, and he studied the way that we make decisions. He has a theory based on his work with patients like a man named Elliot, who was a successful businessman until he developed a brain tumor that required surgery. When Elliot recovered, it became clear that his emotional, emotional connections to the world had been damaged. He was still highly intelligent and rational, but he no longer had any feelings. When he was faced with choices, even minor everyday choices, like when to make an appointment or what to eat for lunch, he couldn't do it. 
because no one option had a better feeling because he didn't have an emotional response to any of his choices. He couldn't make a decision or maintain a relationship or even register what he did or didn't like. And as a result, his businesses failed and his marriage faded away. Antonio Damasio uh, believes that we are guided to our decisions, not primarily by facts or conscious logic, but by largely unconscious emotional memories triggered by visual cues or smells or sounds we might never be aware of, working pre-consciously or intuitively to make us choose one thing, one product, one partner, one political party over another. Now that probably doesn't surprise us, especially as we find ourselves in the midst of what is probably going to be a very divisive elect election season and a global pandemic, racial tensions, and most of us probably wonder why many of our neighbors choose to vote for people we're suspicious of or policies we don't understand or downplay and minimize the seriousness of what we face in this time or refuse to wear masks and exercise social distancing. And we wonder why that happens. See, we make decisions based on loyalty, based on hope, based on fear, trying to avoid a world where we and those we care about might suffer or struggle, looking for a future that's secure. So Luke tells the story of a man who asked Jesus what was a political question, looking for security in his future. Teacher? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Luke says the man was testing Jesus, wanting to see whether Jesus belonged to the right group, whether he was wearing the right colored tie. But his question was bigger and deeper than it appeared. If eternal life is to be a blessing, not a curse, it needs to be in a place where we and those we care about can, can prosper and be safe. Eternal life in a war zone or in lawless chaos is a definition of hell. So what must we do, the man was asking. How can we live to make a world with justice and at peace? Now Luke also says that the man was a lawyer. So Jesus asked him what he had read in the law. And the man replied with a stock and standard answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your hope, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You have given the right answer, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will live. That's the way to make a world worth living in. That's the kind of world, world you'd want to live in for a long time. A world where the law says the first and highest value is love. But the man, the man wasn't satisfied. Luke says he wanted to, to justify himself. Maybe he wanted to demonstrate his cleverness. Maybe he was looking for some kind of, of guarantee, wanting to prove to himself and those around him that he deserved a place in that, in that perfect world. But he had missed the point. So instead of asking what love is, or how he could live in love with God and with his neighbor as himself, which would have been excellent questions, he asked a question of law, a question of legal definition. Who is my neighbor? Define who my neighbor is. It looks like the man was trying to limit his exposure. He was doing his risk assessment and making himself a small target for any potential criticism about who'd, who he'd include in his neighborhood. He probably wanted Jesus to say that his neighbor was the person next door or maybe someone from his village. He probably also wanted Jesus to give him a definition like the one that uh, Lord Atkin in England came up with 
in a legal case that began when a woman in Scotland found a dead snail in her bottle of ginger beer. And she sued the ginger beer brewer. The case went all the way to the House of Lords, and apparently as part of his judgment, Lord Atkin defined the neighbor principle, which says, the rule that you are to love your neighbor becomes in law. You must not injure your neighbor. That's very close to what most teachers of Torah might have said to answer the man's first question. Their answer would probably have been, do not do to someone else something you would not like them to do to you. That's manageable. It's realistic. It's rational. It's practical and it is achievable. But that, that's not what Jesus said to this man who'd asked him who his neighbor is. Instead, he told the story that we know well about this man attacked and robbed on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. The priest and the Levite in the story who saw the man but did nothing to help him were justified by the law. They did nothing to harm the man, nothing to injure him. They simply passed him by. They could even have argued that passing by was the proper thing to do. They didn't know what was wrong with the man. They didn't know if the robbers were still around and if the man was sick or if he died while they were with him. Torah said that that would have made them unclean. For a priest or for a Levite, a religious lawyer, that would have left them unable to work until they had been purified. So you could argue at law that they were right. And Jesus really doesn't criticize or condemn them. But when a Samaritan comes along, and we can modernize him in all sorts of ways, a refugee, an immigrant, a Democrat, a Republican, a Black Lives Matter protester, a policeman. And when he saw the man on the road, he felt compassion. The Greek word for compassion, translated, means his bowels were moved, his inner parts were moved. Now, we might now say he saw himself in the beaten up man, and his mirror neurons fired. But however we describe it, it was an emotional response. And that feeling, rather than any logical process, led him to do whatever he could, and more than could be expected for someone who, in, in other circumstances, he might not have welcomed to live next door. When he finished the story, Jesus asked the man in the crowd, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. And the lawyer replies, the one who showed him mercy. The way to eternal life, according to Jesus, the way to a life worth living, and the way to a world we'd want to live in for a very long time is by letting love, not legalism, move us to action. The way to live a life worth living is by feeling things deeply even uncomfortably and inconveniently, and letting that compassion guide our responses. See, life doesn't come from limiting our liabilities, or minimizing our risks, or doing nothing. A life lived fully is open and positive, generous and compassionate and human. One of the most frustrating things about reading the Bible in church is that almost always when Jesus has had a conversation or told a parable, the focus of the story just moves on. And we rarely ever discover what happened to the people that he encountered. In the passage we read today, Jesus told the man who'd asked the question to go and do likewise. But there's absolutely no way that we can discover whether the man who wanted his neighbor defined learned how to live with mercy. Unfortunately, if Antonio Damasio is right, legal arguments probably don't change how people feel. And although this is a persuasive parable, the Good Samaritan doesn't really tell us how to help a hard heart be more tender. The teaching in the parable is quite clear. Our neighbor can be anyone in whom we also see ourselves. 
anyone with whom we identify or sympathize or empathize. And maybe that's what loving my neighbor as myself ultimately means. But what if I can't see someone as my neighbor? What if fear or greed or prejudice stops me from seeing that the person I'm looking at is just like me? And it looks like Jesus told parables because there's something in a story that makes space for some humanity to grow. When, when someone tells a story, we pause for a moment. We try to imagine the scene. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho, for example, and we use, use our own experience, our memories, our emotions, to fill in the gaps between words. If the story is well told, we're drawn into it. It absorbs us. Things we already know are reinforced, and we give the storyteller time and trust to take us into something we don't know. In the story that Jesus told, the priest and the Levite were true to form. They did what everyone thought that they would do. But the Samaritan man came with a twist. See, everyone expected Samaritans to keep to themselves. So a Samaritan man who felt compassion for a Jewish man on the road from Jerusalem, that was a surprise. And in that surprising insight, in that moment of fresh vision, a space for humanity and mercy grew. Sadly, much of the time, and we're seeing more of that in this time, we're pressured, especially in this culture and society, to ignore our feelings and emotions, to focus on ourselves and our needs and our freedoms, and to deny and ignore that we are connected to each other, and that we do have a responsibility for each other. We're told that stories are a waste of time, that vulnerability is risky, and that tenderness cannot be trusted, and that compassion is weakness. So instead of living with love, we ignore our neighbors and we try to turn God into an idea, into rules, into laws. But as Antonio Damasio tells us, our emotions are our compass and our guide to a life worth living and a world worth living in. And Jesus tells us stories designed to transform and surprise. So maybe we need to hear and tell more stories and to let both the joy and the sadness of other people's lives move us, move our inner parts to the compassion and mercy that we need to inherit eternal life. Amen. As we move into a time of prayer, we hold in our prayers all that is happening in our world today. We hold all those who are struggling, we hold all those who are grieving. We hold all those who are frightened and angry, frustrated and lonely. So let us bring all our needs and concerns to God in this time. Most loving, most holy God, in these days of knowing, not knowing, we like the buds on the trees are eager to burst forth into the world. Hold us gently in place until we are certain in the ways of loving our neighbor. Let us not toss ourselves and neighbor into thoughtless harm. Let us recall, O oh God, that all life is sacred in your eyes. Help us love each other, O oh God, because each and every one of us is loved by you. 
You seek a blessing, O oh God, upon those who have answered a call to care for us in our times of physical healing. No matter our opinion, our ideology, our hardship, Lord, those, these we hold in our care as neighbors. Help us, O oh God, to hear that caring for one another is your command on our lives. Open our ears to hear the tragedy in this time and not only our own anxiety and grief that may come on blustering words and tired rhetoric. Instead, let us think on how we can make the world a better place. Help us, O oh God, to think on what kindness however small we might offer someone. Let us remember that our life is not our own, but belongs to you. Let us dream, O oh God, how we might enter our communities to be a beacon of hope for those living in disorder, to come alongside them while they find order, alongside them while they reorder their lives. Help us always, O oh God, to remember our promise to you that we will care for our neighbor as ourselves. We bring all these prayers to you, O oh God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you, if you have an offering, to place it in the basket on that table as you leave. Um, and for those of you who are watching online, um, the information on how to give online um, or how to make your offering towards the mission and ministry of the Oasis United Church of Christ is on your screen right now. Let us bring our gifts of time, talent, and treasure to God. And let us join together in our unison prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Receive our gifts and our thanks, O God. Take them and expand them that love may be shared between us and with those who long for a greater love. Amen. There aren't a whole lot of announcements. Um, the, the only big one is that um, we are planning a virtual Bible school uh, the week of July 13th to 17th uh, in the evening uh, via Zoom. Um, and we are partnering with three other churches, uh, National Avenue Christian Church in Springfield, uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church in Springfield, and St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Loman. Um, and so we should have about 25 to 30 kids uh, participating, um, and we're looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, Reverend Jody Furness Wright and I will be partnering in leading it, and we've got volunteers from all our churches helping. So it should be a lot of fun, um, and I'm looking forward to it. If you do have or know of people who would like to participate and who haven't registered, they have a couple more days if they would like to. Um, just send me an email, um, and I will include them. Are there any other announcements we need to share with each other? Nancy? So Eleanor Deersing passed away yesterday, um, and also Armin Clemmy is celebrating 70 years as a minister. Yeah. So, and 65 married, yes. Any other announcements? So we will continue to meet outside, weather permitting, um, and heat permitting. 
um, and then make a decision um, about moving in once it becomes clear that we can't do that anymore. Um, so watch your email and Facebook uh, for updates on that. Now let us sing our closing hymn, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant. Let us make our commitment to live in loving community. We will go from here in faith to build a community of love together, to spread that hope into all the world, and to point to the love of God for all people. My friends, so now we leave the space of worship. And while so much of the road ahead continues to be uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know that Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. Go in peace to love and to serve our God. Amen. Amen.